Welcome to our worship service that was held at Grace Lutheran Church of rural Mosinee, Wisconsin on March 13th, 2022. I'm Pastor Paul Vander Gallion. Sermon text for today was Jeremiah chapter 26, beginning at verse 8, with the theme, God sends people to proclaim his word. Thank you for joining us today. house. 
Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city and all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to speak to you all these things in your hearing. Here ends our first lesson. The second lesson is from Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And please stand for the Gospel lesson. We hear from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, and I'll drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here ends the Gospel lesson. Good Friday that is very haunting 
in its melody and also in the questions that it asks during that piece. Uh, it's called Within the Shadow of the Cross. And as you're singing that song or listening to it, you are taken to Mount Calvary and you see Jesus up on the cross and there's a little boy standing there in the shadow of the cross. And he's wondering, why did he have to die? It's an important question. A question that not only little boys ask, but that all of us need to ask, why did Jesus have to die? That question has been answered in a number of different ways. Uh, the Bible answers it in several ways. Uh, modernists add to that. I'm not too um, comfortable with their answers, but the, the Bible says this. Um, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. It was Pontius Pilate that condemned Jesus to death by crucifixion. What was Pontius Pilate thinking? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus had been brought to him early in the morning for a, a quick trial, and that after Pilate questioned him, he saw no basis for a charge against Jesus, that he was innocent, that he should have been let go. And he said, and he said to the people who brought Jesus, I'm going to let him go, he has done anything wrong. And, um, but they insisted. And throughout that discourse, they became very much more and more adamant that Jesus had to die. They, they brought up some false charges. They, they brought up some other charges. And, and finally they said, he's leading a rebellion. He's, he's no friend of Caesar. And if, if you're going to let him go, you're no friend of Caesar either. And, and at that point, Pilate decided it would be a lot better just to sentence this basically unknown person to him to die and get this over with instead of causing a riot or possibly losing his job. So Pilate was more concerned about saving his own life than the life of, of Jesus. And so Jesus had to die because Pilate was pressured into sentencing him. A modernist, some look at it a little bit differently. And they, they use their reason, they don't follow scripture, they don't follow history, but they say, well, because Jesus was raising up some opposition to the Roman government, and the Roman government didn't like that, and, and Jesus could possibly, possibly be leading a, maybe a minor rebellion against Rome. He was committing treason, and, and he had to be executed. So they, they'll go so far as to say that that Pilate arranged it all, which, which can't be true, because Pilate really wouldn't have known much about Jesus before that. And, and the Bible clearly says the reason why um, Pilate condemned Jesus to death. It was not to prevent a rebellion against Rome, it was to prevent a, a riot which would have held Pilate guilty and made him lose his job. <coughs> Herod Antipas. There's a number of different Herods in the New Testament. This is one that is ruling kind of north and east of, of Jerusalem, not Herod the Great, but some relation to him. Uh, we're told in our gospel lesson that some Pharisees came to Jesus and asked him to leave that area because Herod wanted to kill him. Jesus had to die because Herod thought Jesus had to die. Why, why would Herod think that? We're not told exactly why, but there's some speculation that maybe Jesus' connection to John the Baptist, who had spoken against the sins of Herod Antipas, and maybe he was afraid Jesus would continue to uh, condemn him for his sins, to silence him. There, there is a, a thought that maybe Herod even thought that John the Baptist had come back from the dead and that he had to get rid of John the Baptist again. The Bible shows that. But Herod did not want Jesus around, and so he, he's seeking to kill him, um, to get rid of him because of that backstory. Uh, others that wanted Jesus to die, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, uh, also the Pharisees. It's kind of interesting as you're reading through the Gospels, it doesn't, you don't have to read very far into the Gospels to find out that Jesus met some very strong opposition from the religious leaders. Um, a lot of the people um, loved to be around Jesus, they crowded to listen to him, they, they enjoyed being healed. His, his lessons, his, his speaking about the relationship with God and the kingdom of heaven. But the religious leaders, they saw Jesus as a threat to their authority. So in Mark chapter 11, 
uh, account of Jesus cleansing the temple, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So it's kind of jealousy. They had the crowds before, and now this new guy came. Well, by this time, Jesus is three years into his ministry, but they're losing their audience, and Jesus is considered to be a rival, and so they, they wanted to get rid of him for that reason. Uh, in John chapter 5, um, earlier in Jesus' ministry, Jesus had healed a man at the pool of Bethesda. He did that on the Sabbath day. I was supposed to work on the Sabbath day, and the Jewish people come up with a lot of rules and regulations about what was considered work that went beyond what God considers work. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, healing people, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. He said, God doesn't take the Sabbath day off. And I'm not going to either. And I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The crime of making yourself equal with God is called blasphemy. And because Jesus said, well, it's all right for me to work because God is working all the time, and so if I'm working all the time, I must also be God. Uh, they didn't like that at all. In fact, when Jesus was arrested and his trial before Caiaphas, the, the crime that they <coughs> sentenced him to death for was, was blasphemy. He makes himself out to be the Son of God. Uh, which under normal circumstances would mean that you would be worthy of death. But if you're a God and you make yourself equal to God, then it's not blasphemy, it's just stating who you are, which is what Jesus did. But in their mindset, he had to die because of blasphemy. These are some of the reasons the Bible gives as to why Jesus had to die, because of Pontius Pilate's being pressured, Herod, considering Jesus a threat, the, the religious leaders um, wanting to get rid of Jesus because of his teaching and what he was doing and what they considered blasphemy. Jesus tells us that this had to happen, that he had to die because it was God's plan. In Mark chapter 14, he says, the Son of Man, which he uses to refer to himself, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Jesus knew it had been prophesied in the Old Testament on numerous occasions that the Son of Man would come into the world and he would have to die as a sacrifice for sin and that this was God's plan and that it would have to happen because it was his Father's will. In fact, if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, after his last supper with his disciples, and they'd gone into the garden to pray, he struggled and said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He recognized and bowed to his father's plan all along. But he had to die because that was how God was going to save the world. And so he says, it will happen just as it is written about me. In the epistles, the letters to various congregations, by, mainly by Paul, but also by Peter, and James, and John. Uh, Paul has this to say in Romans, you see that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he's doing it for us. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And the soul who sins is the one who deserves to die. And the Bible clearly teaches that when we come into the world, we have a sinful human nature. That we are by nature enemies of God. That we are sinners. That we are deserving of not only physical, but also of eternal death. And then that sinful human nature will demonstrate itself in, in actual sins. Doing things we're not supposed to do. Not doing the things we should be doing. We all sin. 
And we sin daily. In the eyes of the world, some people's sins might be greater sins than, than other people's, but, but each sin that we commit is equally worthy of death. Not because of the severity of the sin itself, but because of the person against whom we are sinning. And because we're sinning against a holy and just God in His justice, He has every right to condemn each and every one of us to death because of what we would consider to be even the most minor of infractions. But we must admit that not all of our infractions are minor either. <coughs> Excuse me. Why did Jesus have to die? Because He took our place. So that instead of us dying eternally because of our sins, God sent His Son Jesus to take our place, to take the guilt and the punishment for our sins upon Himself so that by His death, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus had to die because we are sinners. We are responsible for Jesus' death. It's not just Pontius Pilate. It's not just the teachers of the law and the Jews and the Pharisees and the people who are opposed to him. It's because we have sinned against God. You may recall a, a powerful movie that was made maybe 20 years ago already called The Passion of the Christ. And it graphically displayed the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, very graphically. It was uh, produced by and directed by Mel Gibson. And you may not know this, but in the scene where Jesus is being nailed to the cross and the spikes are being driven through his wrists, that the actor who held that spike and swung that hammer, do you know whose they are? Whose hands those are? They're Mel Gibson's. Because he wanted to be a part of that showing, at least himself, and obviously it's publicized since then, that he recognized that he also was guilty as a sinner for the death of Jesus. And so we all are guilty of Jesus' death, of Jesus died for all of us, so that our sins are forgiven. We are the ones who have rebelled against God. And as those who have rebelled against God, God warns people. In the Old Testament, He warned people that they were to repent of their sins and to prevent what I would call temporary disasters, temporary punishment, and that if they did reform their ways and did repent of it, God would spare them from that disaster. Jesus fully saves us from disaster by his death on the cross, so that now, looking back, we recognize that we are saved by what has already been done for us. But God still calls us to repent of our, our current sins. He doesn't say, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross for all your sins, I've forgiven you, so go and live any way you want. You will not find a passage in the Bible that tells us to go and do that. There are some passages that say people were saying that, so because God forgives us, let's sin more so that grace may increase, but that is um, strongly opposed by St. Paul. No, God doesn't want us to continue in our sins. He doesn't want us to rebel against them. He doesn't want us to commit even little sins. And so God sends people to us, and uses us to share God's word with other people to warn us of the severity of our sins, to call us to repentance, to turn from them, and to look back to Jesus, who has already died for our sins. So that instead of continuing in sin, instead in the, in the joy of forgiveness, we may dedicate ourselves to living for Jesus, who died for us and was raised again. God sends people to share His word of law, of warning, and also, after they repent, the message of the gospel, the good news, that sins are paid for. 
In the Old Testament, God would often send prophets. And in our Old Testament lesson for today, we have an example of one of those prophets, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, whose ministry carried, took place for about 40 years, and he was, in our text, sent to Jerusalem. Uh, before the destruction of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed in 586 B.C., but God sends Jeremiah to, to warn the people of Jerusalem that they are to reform their ways, and if they reform their ways, what is going to happen? He said, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform this house and the city all the things you have heard. Uh, or now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. So there's a warning to repent, but also a promise that if they did, because of God's grace, he would spare them, at least for the time being. God sent Jeremiah. How did the people respond to his message? How did the, the leaders of Jerusalem respond to this man coming to their city and saying, because of your wickedness, because of the way you're carrying out your policies, because of your turning to other gods, because of your mistreating of the poor, because of your seeking out other nations to help you instead of God, because you turn away from God, God is going to destroy this city and he's going to destroy this temple because of what you're doing wrong. How did they respond? As soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, you must die. They did not receive it. They were intent on sentencing him to death, to silencing him as though if you could silence the messenger, the message is no longer true, that they could prevent this. This is not an isolated case. In our gospel lesson, we have Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem when Jesus was told to flee the area of Herod Antipas's jurisdiction because Herod wanted to kill him. Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, he said, no. He said, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I must work today, tomorrow, and the next day. Um, that's what God's plan is for me. And, and because I'm not in Jerusalem, and God's plan is for me to die in Jerusalem, I, I won't be put to death here. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. And then he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers together chicks, but you were not willing. And Old Testament history shows that many of the prophets whom God sent to his people were rejected, cast out. Not all of them, but some of them were killed and in various ways. And that they rejected not only the messengers, but they rejected the message that God had sent those people to proclaim. And when Jesus came, through whom God spoke to his people, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive it. The religious leaders, as noted earlier, they, they saw what Jesus was doing, they, they went out and spied on him at times, they saw firsthand exactly what he was teaching and how he was carrying out his ministry, and it led them to decide this man's got to go. We need to kill him. And humanly speaking, they were able to accomplish that. They may have patted themselves on the back and said, what a great job we've done. We've gotten rid of Jesus. And not understanding that this was God's plan all along. Jesus rose from the dead, showing that God's plan had worked. That Jesus had sacrificed himself for the sins of the world. He was raised again for justification, showing that our sins had been paid for. And then Jesus sent out his apostles. He said, go and preach the gospel to all nations. But in preaching the gospel, they didn't preach just the good news. In order for people to receive the good news, they had to hear first the bad news. They had to hear why Jesus had to die. And Peter and Stephen and Paul were very adamant that it was because of our sins that Jesus had to die. And they would at times 
accuse their audience of being the ones who put Jesus to death. How do you think those people respond? How do we today respond when someone tells us that what we're doing is wrong? That we are sinner, that we are sinning, that we are responsible for Jesus' death. And that even though Jesus has died for our sins, that if we continue in sin, God will discipline us, even if nobody else ever finds out what we did. Even if we're able to hide those sins. Even if society says, you know what the Bible said thousands of years ago was a sin? It was wrong. It made you feel guilty. Well, we're, we're enlightened. Those things aren't wrong anymore. And without giving any specifics, we know that we live in a society today that does not call sin, sin. It actually applauds those who continue in sin, and we who condemn that as sin are the ones who are in the wrong. Human nature does not want to hear that what we're doing is wrong, does not want to listen, is not willing to reform our ways, and it is not to the point where those whom God sends to proclaim the law so that people can repent and hear the good news that Jesus died for them. It's not to the point yet where people are saying, you must die or sentence Christians to death. It's not in our country. But we know that God's word is not always received well. It may not be adamantly opposed. It's more like Neglected. Well, if you're going to tell me those things, I'm just not going to listen to you. And I'm not going to go where you're talking. And I'm not going to interact with you because I really don't want to hear it. So I'm just going to distance myself from that and, and just go on and live my life. And, and that's, to me, how people are rejected whom God sends to share the word. Is that they are just abandoned. It must have been very difficult for Jeremiah when he was sent to the people of, of Israel and people um, who were seeking his life. But what we also find out is that not everybody was against him. We're told right after our text, starting at verse 16 of Jeremiah 26. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, this man should not be sentenced to death. So there's two groups. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Some of the elders of the land stepped forward and said to the entire assembly of people, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. He told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple at Hill a mound overgrown with thickets. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else in Judah put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favor? And did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring the disaster he pronounced against them? We are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. Now Uriah, son of Shemaiah from Kiriath, Jair, was another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, who prophesied the same things against this city and this land as Jeremiah did. When King Jehoiakim and all his officials and officers heard his words, the king sought to put him to death, but Uriah heard of it and he fled in fear to Egypt. King Jehoiakim, however, sent Elnathan, son of Achbor, to Egypt along with some other men. They brought Uriah out of Egypt and took him to King Jehoiakim. When him struck down with a sword and his body thrown into a burial place to come and so he was spared temporarily, but then they brought him back and killed him. Furthermore, Ahikam, son of Japheth, supported Jeremiah, and so he was not handed over to the people to be put to death. So that's the situation. The Lord sends Jeremiah to these people. He proclaims disaster. There's a group that wants to kill him, but others step up and defend him, and he is spared. He is supported. You may know people today who are faithfully proclaiming God's word 
as pastors, as teachers, as those who just are very open in sharing their, their faith in Jesus Christ, who are facing some opposition or are being disheartened and, and may feel like they're all alone, like Elijah did. You can be among those who support them, to reassure them of God's plan, and that the Lord is with them and will be at their side. That's the assurance that Paul had when he faced a lot of opposition in the New Testament. And he says, even though everybody else deserted me, the Lord is at my side. But he was maybe exaggerating a little bit as far as everybody deserting him. Because elsewhere in his epistles, he'll talk about people <coughs> supporting him. Supporting. So, so we learned several lessons from today. At times, God sends you to share the word of God with others. It may be a message of law where you have to reprimand somebody. Call them to reform their ways. So that when they do, you can reassure them that Jesus had died for them. And that they are forgiven. You have eternal life. You may be among those who support those who, who share the word of God. And at times, we are all among those who are on the receiving end of the reprimand. And uh, even though we may not like being reprimanded, but we recognize that that reprimand is coming from God's Word and someone who cares about our souls, um, we ought to confess our sins. Oh, God, be merciful to me as we sing. That is something that we know that when we turn from our sins and look to God, even though we have sinned, we are forgiven because Jesus had to die for us. And will it did it. And when we are reassured of that forgiveness, we are filled with the good news of, of God's love and forgiveness. And the Holy Spirit empowers us. So that as we move forward, we can seek to live lives that are pleasing to God. In what we say, as we share the word, and in the actions that we carry out. Amen. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, <coughs> comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations. And we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth, where there are wars and there is peace, where there is hatred and blood and evil, where there is poverty, danger, or disaster. Come with your almighty power to help and be sure. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. <laughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only Thee. Trusting Thee for full salvation, great and free. I am trusting.
sing before pardon at thy feet I bow. For thy grace and tender mercy trust in now. I am trusting thee for cleansing in the crimson flood. Trusting thee to make me holy by thy blood. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who lives and reigns with you on the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.